Uh, my name is Maria Luisa Gornotempini or Marilu Gornotempini. I'm a behavioral neurologist at UCSF in the Department of Neurology and Psychiatry. I co-direct the Dyslexia Center at UCSF and um, thank you for inviting me, for uh, letting me participate to uh, Breaking Barriers. I love the name and the mission of the organization and uh, I think my goal today is to kind of um, uh, show you how in the medical neuroscience world we're also trying to break barriers, and specifically trying to break barriers between different disciplines. So uh, neurology, psychiatry, psychology, and, and also education. And the reason is because both cognitive disorders of learning disorders and what are now called mental health disorders all come from the brain. They all um, they all have their basis in brain physiology, in brain neurobiology, and the fact that they manifest as cognitive issues, reading issue, attention issues, or as psychiatric symptoms, as anxiety, hyperactivity, impulsivity, it only depends on which circuits in the brain are involved. And we know more and more from neuroscience that these networks are all um, interacting with each other and developing together and aging together. And so we need to take this whole brain approach again and try to break down the barriers between disciplines that have been so um, impactful in stopping progress or delaying progress in the science, medical care, and education of kids with learning differences. So the new approach that we've taken at UCSF was really mirrored um, the approach that was taken by the Memory and Aging Center in studying diseases of aging. And of course, here we're talking about diseases, we're talking about Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, and these neurodegenerative disorders that for reason that we starting to uncover uh, and discover are um, hitting specific networks in the brain. And so people in the 50s, 60s, 70s start to lose some functions that are um, specifically associated with, neuro, um, with uh, um, specific neural circuits. And the Memory and Aging Center was started back in 2001 with 10 people. We were only 10 and now as an organization of more than 300 with the mission of research, education and public care and a public mission. So here we have a clinic we have a, where we take care of patients. We have a research center where we do clinical science. So meaning neuroimaging lab, looking at lab works, looking at people cognition and mental health longitudinally. But also we have a clinic where we take care of patients. And we also have a mission of education for family and uh, primary care doctors and all is in one place that is a hub where new ideas and new projects can always be added on. And so that's where we are with the Dyslexia Center. We built the center with the same idea. It would be a leading uh, cognitive neurology, psychiatry, psychology center, and it will be exclusively focused on neurodevelopmental differences. And it seems like there should be a place like that already, uh, but there isn't. So to give you a little bit of a visual of our approach, um, we like to call it from bench to classroom, but I think is now from bench to classroom and beyond, uh, since we have included a policies, policy justi justice um, aspect of our center. So we do basic science and clinical research. Uh, we take care of families. We work with schools and schools of education, especially Berkeley and Stanford, to um, uh, make sure that we have a communication with, between um, learning sciences and basic and medical sciences. We wanna use technology to um, uh, expand our reach to uh, uh, populations around the country and internationally. And we have a close relationship with the state legislature to uh, try to, um, uh, again, expand our reach to uh, social justice and um, uh, policy. So having all of these different um, aspects all together and working together 
in one same environment is quite unique. And I think we have the opportunity with the support also at the state level right now to really move the needle for our children. I'll tell you a little bit more about the UCSF part of the, uh, uh, the center. Uh, it involves psychiatry, neurology, and basic neurosciences. At the Mission Bay campus, there are three uh, buildings dedicated only to this. It's really a unique opportunity. Um, I'm originally from Italy. At some point, I thought I was going to go back to Italy, but this is just a dream come through for, for a, sin, a clinician scientist. And so at the end, I never managed to leave. Uh, so the Pritzer Child Teen Family Center is the brand new psychiatry building that will open in the summer of next year. Uh, the Walla Institute for Neurosciences is uh, um, uh, already built and will open in February. And the Sandler Neuroscience Center was a pioneer uh, neurology uh, building at Mission Bay that has been open for the past five years and where we've been doing most of our research. We have a lot of partners in the community. We started with the partnership with the Charles Armstrong School. That's how the UCSF Dyslexia Center started, uh, thanks to Steve um, uh, Carnivale and, um, uh, and Dave Evans. And, um, and then we expanded to the Chartwell School, uh, from whom you'll hear a little bit um, uh, about in the, our breakout session later. Uh, and also with new uh, public schools, the Gateway School in San Francisco, and um, we'll start soon a study at the Mission Dolores Academy. Our idea is not just to look at the weaknesses in kids with learning differences, but also on, on their strengths. Um, this is one of the missions of the UCSF Dyslexia Center and also the new established uh, Schwab Dys uh, Dyslexia and Cognitive Diversity Center in collaboration with the University of Berkeley, where um, we can expand to public health and school of education. So the center started looking at reading and reading disorders. I had started uh, studying reading in adults with uh, neurodegenerative conditions or stroke or tumors, any type. This is a model that we use to study the brain. We look at people who have difficulty with a specific function. We look at their brain to see where uh, that difficulty uh, locates in the brain. And from that, we can infer what those regions and networks in the brain do and how they work in um, healthy or typically developing uh, individuals. Um, so the study of reading really started in adults. And um, uh, we are fortunate that we have decades of experience in studying in uh, studying reading and cognition and, and uh, behavioral in, in adults. And we can apply that um, to children. Um, sadly, and it hasn't been done that much. It hasn't been done that much. There's been an incredible amount of funding for the study of adult neurological diseases, which is totally fine. And I'm not saying that it shouldn't happen, but there haven't been the same amount to study the um, uh, challenges in children. And that is because we've had this kind of falling through the cracks or are these, is reading an academic problem or a neurological, is an academic function or a neurological function. Now we know as a neurological function, every cognitive function and every thought that we have comes from the brain. So this is the gap that we need to reach. It is a, it is something that is studied and uh, um, educated and developed in school, but it has a neurological basis. So we have to, um, by definition, work together to better understand it. It's a skill that is uniquely human. So there is a big debate in the scientific world, what is innate to the human brain and what we need to learn. Is language an innate function in the brain? Is face recognition an innate function in the brain? Does that mean that when babies are born, they already can recognize faces or understand language? Now, it is a debate that, I, that is still happening. What I think, and I think most of the science shows, is that we have the machinery for language when we are born. We have the machinery to recognize faces when we're born, we still have to develop it. And these are basic cognitive functions. Um, 
uh, really understanding hearing language, understanding that words are not just sounds that animal makes, that I think is already there. And it, it is already there because it's developed through uh, evolution and, uh, um, and so we might be born with it. So newborn can distinguish whether a sound is speech or not. From there to saying they can understand speech, it's a whole different matter. Now, babies are not born recognizing letters. They're not born reading. So reading is an incredible um, uh, example of brain plasticity because it needs to be taught. We don't have the brain networks to, um, that are already set up for reading. We have brain networks for vision and we have brain networks for auditory processing and for recognizing speech and sounds. Then we have to put them together to create reading. So it needs to be explicitly taught. There is a variability in individuals on how automatic and how much they need to be taught to learn these skills. And this, this is being shown to be heritable. So there are families of super readers and very few, 1%, of the population that can read even without being taught. The majority of us needed to be taught. Maybe some of us took a few months or some others took a couple of years, but there is a range. Uh, but this ability is highly inheritable. It is influenced by culture and writing system. So if uh, reading in Chinese, logographic language, is very different than reading in Italian, which is a completely regular language in which each uh, letter, each symbol corresponds to a sound. That doesn't mean that dyslexia exists only in one culture. It's not true. Dyslexia exists in every country, but it might manifest differently in different languages. And it might be easier or harder to diagnose. Um, so what is dyslexia? I don't know if most of you know what is dyslexia, a specific learning uh, disability of neurological origin. Um, what that neurobiological origin is, we do not know. And this is a big uh, issue for me that we'll talk about a little bit later. Um, is it difficulties with accurate and fluent word recognition and with poor spelling and decoding abilities? It's clear that there is a preserve cognitive abilities and adequate uh, needs to happen in the context of preserved cognitive abilities and adequate instruction, if we want to call it uh, dyslexia. And this is where things become hard and we get into diagnosis paradox because we know that there are basic cognitive skills that are necessary, as we were saying, to build the building blocks of reading that we can look at even before children are reading. But how can we diagnose dyslexia when uh, children have not been taught to read yet? So do we need to wait them to fail at reading before identifying? And the answer is, of course, no, but the problem is not trivial and it's something that we're actively working on. And then there is types, the issues, types of dyslexia. So most often um, it is a phonological difficulty. It is a difficulty with manipulating uh, the sounds that make up words. And this difficulty in, with phonology can uh, manifest as errors in speech and reading and spelling, slow world retrieval, so difficulty in rapid naming, and phonological short-term memory difficulties, meaning difficulty holding on to words and sounds in your immediate memory. The same process we use to remember a phone number. So someone tells us a phone number, we need to hear it, and then we need to kind of rehearse it in our head before we can say we've learned it. Now the term dyslexia has been controversial. Um, DSM preferred terminology, specific learning disorder with reading disorder. What we think is that actually the, the, there are more phenotypes of dyslexia, and although the majority have phonological difficulties, there is other uh, uh, aspects of cognition that um, uh, are, can be responsible for a reading problem. So what is the whole brain approach? Now, whole brain approach, we know the brain is made of two hemispheres and um, that there are different pathways. This is a very schematic way to thinking about that. There are hubs in the brain that do certain things and there are connections between these hubs and they make circuits. And these circuits are somehow predetermined. So in development, um, these connect 
connections create between um, these um, different hubs in the brain. They can be genetically be, um, have different uh, strengths and weaknesses, and then we can work on them because of plasticity to create them. For instance, the, these are classic visual areas in the left hemisphere, and these are classic phonological areas. So these are areas that we use for speech and language. These are areas that we use to vision we need to bind them together for reading to happen. But then we see all the different other types of connectivity that happens um, to this, let's say, reading brain uh, circuits. So any difficulties in any of these different hubs of connections can influence the development of these reading brain. And for that reason, we think that there can be different reasons. Uh, for uh, a person, the different mechanism uh, uh, for a child to have difficulties um, uh, reading. So what does the left hemisphere do? What are all these networks in the left hemisphere do? Mainly language, symbolic um, processing, abstract symbolic processing. So it's a place where we learn vocabulary, uh, meaning, semantics, grammar, how words go together to make sentences, phonology, how sounds go together to make words, orthography, how do we translate uh, sounds into uh, written symbols and how do we read written symbols to create language and also the uh, verbal symbolic part of math. The right hemisphere, what is its specialization? Visual perception, so being able to distinguish, for instance, one face from the other. Uh, that's a typical difficult perceptual skill that happens in the more ventral part of the uh, right hemisphere. Visual spatial. So visual spatial means um, uh, how do things go in space? Where, how do we navigate our environment? How do we see ourselves in space? Like if I am uh, on the Golden Gate Bridge and I'm going north, what is on my right side and what is on my left side? This is sometimes a uh, um, a question that I ask uh, my patients in clinic to have an idea of their vis visual spatial functioning without testing um, formally. Um, emotion and social functioning. This is super important. Emotion and social functioning. There are two th different things. Recognizing emotion and understanding emotions is one uh, function that is very important for the right hemisphere, but also social interactions. That is very different from emotion. There is a basic knowledge of emotions, and then is how we use emotions to navigate our social environment. But social um, uh, cognition is not just emotion, it's also understanding intentions, is understanding when to stop and when to talk, is understanding how to take turns, is understanding the consequences of my actions on someone else. So when we talk, I know there is this very um, popular term of social emotional functioning. Let's keep in mind that they're separate. They all happen in the right, mainly in the right hemisphere, mainly in the frontal lobes, but there are two separate um, uh, uh, cognitive behavioral symptoms. Uh, some uh, part of musicality is very right hemisphere and also some visual part of math. And this is very important, very dear to me because many children with dyslexia um, who have some kind of difference in the left hemisphere can have very high functioning in math if it's taught uh, the proper way. So why is it important to know about these networks? And of course, I'm just giving you some names here. And um, oh, I forgot to mention the executive control attention network, which I kind of put in pink here. And you can think about that as kind of the supervisor of all these things and putting different um, kind of, uh, it's called executive because you can somehow think of it as some of the function that an executive would do, give resources to different uh, parts of the, of the other networks that are needed in that, moaning, that moment, uh, pay attention to one thing and, and forget about the noise of, of, uh, of the uh, rest of, uh, of uh, what is going on in the room and focus on what is important. Um, switch, being able to switch from one situation to another. Executive functioning is a big bucket. Again, it's just like saying language. An executive functioning can both be right hemisphere and left hemisphere. And that is quite confusing because we thinking of attention as a unitary problem. Does, does a child have uh, ADHD, an attention uh, problem? But 
Do they have a verbal attention problem? Do they have a visual attention problem? So these are, is another way of interacting of the different um, networks. Very important because what we're learning from um, a science is that these networks are interacting with each other. And here I have a little visual, if I can have it play, there we go. And it's just a, it's just a visual to give you an idea of what we're discovering. When one uh, network is working, let's say the blue network, the red network need to shut down. They work in, in um, uh, basically in balance. If both of these networks were going at the same time, it would probably be noisy and inefficient. So for um, uh, uh, ideal, let's say, output, cognitive or emotional functioning, some of these networks need to uh, work in balance. And what we're starting to discover is that one, when this synchronicity um, uh, is not uh, uh, optimal, strengths and weaknesses can, can appear. Not just weaknesses, but also strengths. So when one uh, network is activating in a different way, it's gonna cause the other to function in a different way. And in some ways we think this can be the basis of creativity or um, um, these uh, extreme uh, uh, cognitive diversity uh, situation in which genius can also um, appear. So if we think about our um, children and the difficulties that they can um, uh, encounter in school, and if we concentrate for a moment on reading, and with reading, we're thinking decoding and also reading um, comprehension. We can uh, see that any of these networks that we talked about can influence reading. So there can be a difficulty holding on to sounds, uh, to words, it can be, for instance, a difficulty in processing the sounds that make up words, phonology. It can be difficulty visually, perceptually uh, to uh, organize the visual word that can have an impact on, on reading. And there can certainly be an executive attention difficulty that makes it hard to learn. Uh, how to read. And there is a sensory motor difficulties, motor speech impairment often that can um, uh, delay or cause a problem in reading. So when we think about the uh, function of reading, we need to think about the process, the basic building blocks of cognitive processes that are necessary for automatic reading. And this I think is what we can think about it as a whole kind of brain approach um, to reading that doesn't just concentrate on phonology. But then if we think about our networks in the right of the left hemisphere and thinking which other networks are close to each other or we know are working in balance with each other, we can start thinking about the social emotional brain, let's say, um, that we know is in the right mainly uh, in the right hemisphere. And, you know, I'm simplifying here, of course, all of these systems are interacting, but we know that the main hubs for social emotional functioning are more on the right hemisphere because we've studied for decades patients with lesions, like I was saying, stroke, tumors, neurodegenerative disease in the right hemisphere. And we see that they have problems with recognizing emotions. They have problems in understanding the intentions of others. And so we made the, um, inference that the right hemisphere is involved in, in social emotional and especially when it's visually mediated. So then when we know that we have a child or an adult that has difficulty in uh, or strengths in this um, uh, particular, let's say, visual semantic network, we have to also look at the social emotional because they're close together, they're in balance with each other, we need to look at them together, otherwise we don't really know what's happening. The same example, it could be with math. And we know that math has a component that is symbolic. We saw that is important and it can uh, co-occur with the reading uh, difficulty, but it also has a visual component for high level math, for geometry, trigonometry, calculus. And, um, and so if we put all of this together and we, understand, and we think about all the names that and labels and diagnosis that we give our kids, we understand how they all intersected with each other. They're all part of this brain um, functioning that it all, it's all happening in uh, intersection. And so when we look at a child that has a reading problem 
or a social emotional problem or a sensory motor problem. We need to look at all of this to realize um, what their strengths and weaknesses are and what the core problems behind these expressions of their problem. We can, we can think that dyscalculia is an expression, can be an expression of, a me of a, um, uh, this dorsal pathway to remembering uh, names and so associating names with numbers. So it's not that our, many of our children have comorbid conditions and this having been also a parent in the parent side of this and hearing that, you know, a child has, um, you know, ADHD and dyscalculia and this in auditory processing disorder, no, but it's also working memory. It's not that they have five different things. They have one, often one cognitive and neural um, problem that or difference that mani can manifest in different way. Um, it's quite hard not to see an audience. I can usually, <laughs> I can usually guess if what I'm saying is it's not clear from the facial expressions of my audience. But um, um, I, I hope you'll feel free to ask um, questions um, as uh, 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 afterwards. Uh, or during, uh, as you wish. So if we think in this system of kind of balances with one uh, of these different brain networks, I'll give you an example here. We can get to a point with research and observation and educational practice, I think too, that we can almost um, predict someone's weakness from their strengths and vice versa. So if we see a child, for instance, with a, with a, um, a weakness is in auditory processing or in a phonological short-term memory, uh, we know that the, that system is often, not always, but often in balance with the visual semantic system. So the dorsal speech to phonology system is often in balance with what we call the default mode network of visual semantic system. And these two we've seen in different um, brain uh, disorders across the lifetime that these two are kind of in, in balance with each other. So often when we have kind of this phonological linguistic problem, patients have with, with um, I'm, I'm saying here in the case of uh, patients with um, a stroke or neurodegenerative disease, they might have a different and sometimes enhanced way of processing visual and semantic information. And these can um, translate in strengths. Uh, I'm not saying gifts. I mean, in extreme case, they could be gifts, but still uh, in strengths that we can capture uh, in the way that we um, intervene uh, with these children, and not just academically, also in the home or also in doing psychotherapy or also in uh, providing services in school and also just by teaching them in a strategy using kind of a precision teaching method that goes not just uh, at remediating their, their weaknesses, but also take advantage of their strengths. So the, let's say that the main study that we used to do at UCSF is very changed now in the, in the COVID times, but the main, um, put these slides just to give you an, an idea that we do some, you know, we use the, the um, uh, research um, population at, at UCSF who used to come in at UCSF. Now uh, they come in just for the MRI scan and all the rest is done virtually to uh, as our discovery cohort. So these children and families commit to many hours with us. They go through uh, um, uh, history, neuropsych uh, neuropsychiatric evaluation, neurological evaluation, um, a baseline standard neuropsychological academic battery, and then specific tasks that are designed to isolate those functions of those networks that we've been talking about. So not just looking, you know, the basic academic and neuropsychological batteries give us a good baseline compared to thousands and thousands of people. And it gives an idea, especially the academic battery or where children are in their academic skills. So are they a grade level? There's something that of course is important to know for services in the school, but really doesn't tell us much about what's happening in, in the brain. Uh, those are tests that are well established in the 
uh, academic world. And again, they have their use to see at what school level the kids are, but they're not designed to go back to the brain and tell me which of these cognitive and behavioral mechanisms, why is the child impulsive? I can have a questionnaire in which a parent and a teacher tells me, yes, there is some impulsivity, but where is that impulsivity coming from? Is it because uh, a child cannot um, hold on to the information that the other person is saying? Like when someone speaks, they know that they're gonna forget and so they interrupt and they seem impulsive. But really the problem is not their emotional impulsivity system, it's just that they know they cannot hold on to the information if they don't blur out a an answer right away. So this is to give you an idea, like we don't know why that child might be impulsive, just as we don't know why in many cases, I would say at least 40% of the cases, we don't know why from these academic batteries, why a child is dyslexic, is having trouble reading. And at that point, I'm kind of at a loss on which interventions and to are, are best suited for, for that child. We know that there is a basic intervention that will work for everybody. There is a good, you know, science-based matter to, to teach uh, reading that involves uh, teaching the whole structure of language that reading is built on. Uh, but we know that for many kids that is not necessary and it was striking to me to discover as I got into this field that really we don't have a pathway for that. We don't know. Um, studies have never been done to really um, have the data to prove that one method works better for uh, certain uh, children and, and not others. So until we have that data, I think from a policy and uh, social justice uh, point of view, we really don't have our weapons to uh, prove that uh, what needs to be done. And this is really what we're working on in this discovery cohort at UCSF. Um, we take genetic samples from everybody, uh, um, an MRI uh, scan. Um, we collaborate very closely with schools and we'll get to that. Most of our uh, children come from our partner schools. We have uh, long conferences with the teachers, with the families to try to pave the way and understanding what are the best available teaching strategies for kids with different um, phenotypes of dyslexia. We call them phenotypes. From, from then, um, we hope to move to digital uh, tools um, to scale this really detailed uh, results of this very detailed um, study. And it's not a small study. We already have about 350 kids, but we hope to um, keep recruiting and following uh, children over time. I can tell you that the Memory and Aging Center in its 25 years now has 30,000 um, adults uh, in, their, um, in their database. And that um, data is helping really getting us to the stage where we are of very close to cures for neurodegenerative diseases. So this is our, my um, dream and goal also for neurodevelopment um, differences. So I can give you a little example of one case of uh, our case of dyslexia with typical phonological disorders in our kind of whole brain approach. Uh, we could see that there is this small differences in the phonological network of the brain. In my little scheme, I created this, it's, it's, it's here and there is a difference. The connectivity with the nearing networks is diminished. The kind of corresponding network on the other side is over-regulated. And so to the phonological weakness, we have a corresponding uh, visual strength. I'm going to skip this. At the um, imaging level, we're starting to see a group of kids and individual kids that look very different. Again, to the point that there is not just one uh, dyslexic, but we need to look at the whole brain to really understand where the reading uh, problem is coming from. So you see that he, this child has an asymmetry in this blue tract that is called the superior longitudinal fasciculus. And these two children instead have an asymmetry on this light green tract, it's called the temporal parietal tract, but in the opposite direction. So the one um, child is it's smaller on the right, on the other child is smaller on the left. And these three children at 
all been diagnosed with, with dyslexia. Where does it come from, from a biological point of view? I'm really, really, um, as a, when I wear my medical hat, I'm really interested in this. The images, the many studies in psychology and education departments have been done on dyslexia. Really huge um, um, uh, advances in seeing that there were changes in functions of the brain, but no one has really looked as a radiologist or neuroradiologist or, or neurologist would look at the brain of these children. And if we do look at them, we see little differences and we see little differences that correspond to areas that are important for uh, reading and cognition. Um, we see uh, sometimes this zigzagging of the, of the cortex. This is the gray matter where the neurons are in the brain. And you see this part is a little more zigzag than this one. Or in this case, there is this little dot here. These are not diseases. They don't call epilepsy, they don't cause stroke, but they can be responsible for differences in the brain, such as reading. And we found some of these in at least 40% of our cohort. Now, why is this important from a medical point of view? This means that if I see that and I can prove that there is some relation to from the reading or attention deficits, with these lesions, this becomes a medical problem. That doesn't mean that it's a disease, but it's clearly a medical problem that should be covered uh, by insurance and that should be screened for in very young children to uh, 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 prevent all the stress and uh, trauma that it can be uh, caused um, in, in, future, in future years. I, you know, we need special techniques to look at this now, super expert or special techniques. But again, I'm hoping that with uh, artificial in intelligence and, and engineering methods that we are applying, automatic methods, we'll be able to use this really in the near future also to uh, inform our um, intervention strategies. So I want to give you, uh, spend a little more time um, today in the last 10 minutes. Uh, since I know that this group is very interested in mental health or behavioral health, as we um, describe it um, in a better terms now, I think behavioral um, health, uh, I, I like the term much better than mental health. You know, there was a time in which we thought that mental processes and neurological processes were different. That time is gone. We have a neuroscience building. We have, it might be that we have physicians that are specialized in treating um, uh, uh, psychiatric behavioral issues such as schizophrenia or, or um, bipolar disorders and other physicians that are more uh, and, and, and um, you know health specialists that are more specialized in, in um, caring for people with uh, dyslexia or attention disorders but they all come together from the same brain and we should all be thinking it as different systems of the same brain. So the study that at the, at the uh, UCSF um, Dyslexia Center, we realized I'm a, I'm a language and, and behavioral expert, but I'm not a researcher in emotions. I'm a research in, uh, in language, but we were fortunate enough in the UCSF, the great institution that it is, that I have wonderful collaborators, Virginia Sturman and Eleanor Pauser in particular, who specialize in emotion um, detection and functioning. And so I could bring them into the field and say, we, I would like to look at um, emotion um, processing in dyslexia. We know that the area in the brain that process words is in the left uh, hemisphere and corresponds to a right hemisphere region. The same region in the right hemisphere recognizes faces and emotions in faces. And we know that these two are in balance. Is it possible? that children with dyslexia are more sensitive to emotions, are better at understanding emotion. And I, I shouldn't say better, I, you know, process emotion differently. Could they, the same way in which words don't stick to them, maybe emotions stick to them more. And, and we know that from our um, work with um, Dr. Hendren in psychiatry, that these kids are actually prone to anxiety. So could it be that this mental health, behavioral health um, symptom of anxiety 
is actually the other side of dyslexia. They are anxious because they perceive emotion more than we do. And so they're more sensitive to them. Is that possible? So how do you study that? Very difficult if you don't have a lab that is really set up for that. And we'll go through that. Um, so an example of an emotion, I think most of you will uh, uh, recognize this picture and um, you can realize how with only with visual information there is so much that can be moved in our body and our brain um, uh, just by looking at this picture I, I think especially in this moment in time you know and and some of what we some of the processes that we do when we look in the pictures are very physical, you know, they, they, it's what is called emotional empathy. We have a, a, a bodily reaction to what is happening here. We're feeling the same worry and sadness that um, uh, this uh, woman is, is, is feeling in this difficult time. And, but then we add words to it right? There is a physical kind of, and it's been proven that actually we mimic the same expression that she does when we, when we look at this picture and other very salient picture. Um, but then we also attach words to it and then we see how the two systems um, interact. If we think about our um, kind of very schematic brain model, that kind of visual and visceral reaction to uh, um, the non-visual, a, a visual stimulus like a picture is very right hemisphere. When we, um, ooh, and I misspelled this, but I was trying to think of the left hemisphere um, correspondent to this um, very early this morning. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, you can think that the left hemisphere is, says he's thinking, I'm worried, I'm tired, sad, and I worry about the future of my children. I'm tired. And um, so that's how you put words to that picture. So um, the idea of the uh, study with Virginia was, well, if we have, um, you know, children with dyslexia who have written language difficulties in this ventral part of the left hemisphere that is really involved in visually processing words and attaching visual words to sounds, uh, maybe the emotion empathy system can be enhanced and maybe that can be the basis of some of the um, anxiety that we see in children with dyslexia. So what are emotions? They are short-lived phenomena. They're both psychological and physiological. So um, psychological in the sense that an emotion can alter attention and here it could be a way that we think of why some children with dyslexia really work well one-on-one. -on -one. It's not because, maybe it's not because they just need more attention to phonology. Maybe because one-on-one -on -one they can really relate to their teacher um, emotionally and use that strength to boost their attention to reading. Um, it definitely triggers certain behavior. We all know about the fight or flight re uh, reactions. We all know our, um, reactions to some of the uh, political situation we are in. And it actually activates memory networks. I think all of us will remember these couple of days in which we're living now because of all the emotional uh, and worry uh, content that it's um, uh, um, attached to them. So they're not just, you know, when we think about emotional skills and emotional abilities or you know I always hate the, the 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 kind of the way that women are are labeled as more emotion more emotional it's a real strength to be more emotional to be to have uh, high emotional skills it can help our memory it can trigger our behavior and it can really alter our attention so physiologically is a very complex, they're very complex phenomena. They organize very rap rapidly and they need to organize responses from disparate biological system. Facial expressions are a huge important um, way in which we understand um, uh, uh, and experience uh, emotions and uh, um, uh, uh, muscle tone. Uh, uh, voice prosody, autonomic activity, racing of the heart, 
um, uh, feeling cold or having goosebumps or, you know, muscle tone, very important, important again, for a fight or flight um, uh, reaction. Um, so emotions shape our responses to different situations. Um, there has been a huge tradition at UCSF and in the Bay Area, uh, academic centers and studying emotions. I think this is a graph that I, I really like of how we kind of, um, uh, emotions have been or, um, kind of organized in the scientific realm. There is negative and positive and self-conscious emotions. And each of these type of emotion is linked to a specific physiological response. So we were thinking brain networks that uh, sustain phonology or grammar. Let's think about it this way. There's brain networks that are specific to processing negative and positive emotions. And the response is really, um, uh, uh, stereotyped. And so we can study it in the lab. And how do we study it? Um, I need to move a little faster. So let, let's go here. We study it by showing um, individuals little clips that have been very standardized for um, eliciting certain emotions. And then we, we uh, measure people's reactivity, looking at the changes in the body and face that um, uh, accompany emotions. And then we look at emotion regulation, very important um, part of uh, emotion processing, especially in doing childhood. This emotion regulation part is part of executive functioning. It's part of cognitive control. It's how we modulate all these sensations and emotion uh, stimuli that we receive from my environment. That's why, again, emotion regulation is part of a bigger executive functioning problem, uh, executive fun uh, functioning um, domain, and uh, how all of these functions are intersected. So let me just skip this. It was just the idea to show you how there are the same systems that are involved in language. So there is a system that needs to understand emotions, and then there is a system that creates the output of emotions, so facial expressions, fight or flight, um, uh, um, bodily reaction, and then there is a regulation system that is a cognitive control system, but there is also an, a, an effect of working memory because we need to hold on to those stimuli in the environment. We need to understand those facial expressions that move all the time and that so that we can then understand them, control them, and respond um, to them. So this is the lab, is the Center for Psychophysiology and Behavior, where we study especially emotional uh, behavior. Um, of course, this is not happening right now because of COVID. We're bringing in children and adults just for MRIs and everything else is done um, uh, remotely. And so this is really pushing us on the idea of using uh, wearables to measure physiological responses to emotions. Um, so, uh, I can skip this. I really want to show you some of the, so we, we, um, kind of divided three processes in emotion. We need to recognize emotional stimuli. We need to, um, regulate, we need to have our system to react to them. And then we have to be able to regulate emotions. And these three functions have different brain networks. And I, it, you know, um, we don't have time today to go really into the details, but if you think about that other brain uh, uh, um, figures that we have, you see how partially overlapping, but also how these systems are in the other side of the brain from the language system. And so how they neatly tune one with the other. There is an extra component in the emotional network, which is interception. So we need to really be able to understand and um, regulate our internal states. It's, it's a feedback feed forward loop in which our mind, our brain can regulate what we feel and uh, the feeling it can give our, our brain a way to uh, interpret and, and control the environment. So I'll just show you one example uh, in this one, just to show you how the experiment works. I'm really excited about this because it's really the first time in which we can um, objectively, scientifically uh, measure um, emotion reactivity. 
I can't start the video for some reason. Okay, let's start, try with this one. So in this video, it's an example of a disgusted emotion. So this child is looking at this video, which is um, a cleaning of an inner ear. So disgust is a very primordial emotion. It has a kind of a survival um, um, uh, significance, right? We want to get away from things that are rotten because they give us diseases. So it's very, um, it's very primordial, just as fear is. Some of the other emotions like surprise or um, uh, awe are more complex and in some ways they're more uh, linguistically mediated. But disgust is a very primordial one. Okay, I lost a little bargain. There we go. So this is an example of how different the reactions can be to the same um, to the same stimulus. And this is a typically developing child. He's like, okay, it's not particularly fun. He has some very little movements of the face. This is how we measure the reactivity of the system to, um, to these videos. The, there are coders and hopefully in the near future automatic measures to, um, to measure uh, um, uh, reactivity of the face. And this is a dyslexic child. And you see how different that reaction is. And in the study, we did see that children with dyslexia had increased reactivity, emotional reactivity. So our hypothesis actually came true that children with phonological typical dyslexia, actually this in this group, many of them had increased emotional reactivity. It correlated with brain regions. It correlated with um, uh, uh, data that the parents were giving us about their children, their impression of their children. So what they were saying is that they had higher social skills, um, but also it showed us that these kids can be more prone to anxiety or, or depression. So the, the amount of facial um, uh, uh, reactivity they had was positively correlated with their anxiety and depression. So the fact that they had the skill that they'll have in their life or being so socially capable actually puts them at risk. So as part of our study, we have um, uh, a tool that we've been using in our partner schools that is called EBET in which we measure and follow uh, children over time in, uh, um, to follow their um, um, social emotional functioning. Also, very importantly, we can, now that we have identified this skill, but also this risk in children with dyslexia, we can develop web-based cognitive behavioral intervention tools, again, with another lab that we can collaborate with, a UCSF, which is the Neuroscape lab, that has created a scientifically proven, trial proven uh, game to train attention and mindfulness in, in children. And we have a new, um, study that we will start at the Charles School that you might hear about a little bit more later that really target this strength weakness in our kids. Um, looking at, at you know social determinants of health and the traumatic situation, we really I always like to put the slide about this study, although this is a study in adults, because we the importance of our work in the, in the policy and the law has, uh, has uh, made us realize that we needed to also study populations that are um, uh, an underserved population that are not in the situation of being um, helped or even um, identified sometimes as having learning disorders. We know that there can be a downward spiral in which kids drop out of school and um, can really end up in, in difficult situations. And so we had this um, study in, um, in a federal uh, prison in um, Dublin. So I went way too slow and I have a lot of other slides that I wanted to show you, but I'm gonna skip. Um, and just to get to a conclusion that I hope I convince you that we need to have a whole brain approach 
um, and again, break the barriers between the different uh, disciplines that have been doing research in kids with neurodevelopmental differences from psychology to education to neurology and psychiatry and neuroscience and really applying novel neuroscience concepts um, and measures to better understand the patterns of strength and weaknesses of these children. Um, interventions should definitely include um, structural language uh, uh, teaching, but I really believe that targeted cognitive interventions uh, can also have a role and that one size doesn't fit all and we should really try to apply the precision medicine approach to also education, um, uh, uh, education. Of course, in collaboration with education experts um, that um, are not typically found in medical schools. So clinicians, scientists, educators, and legislators need to come together to solve the downward spiral of learning differences. Um, thank you to everybody, and especially to the team at, at UCSF and at our partner schools. Thank you. Thank you on behalf of Breaking Barriers for your wisdom and expertise, the implications of your uh, research are not only fantastic, um, but self-evident to um, solving the holistic uh, needs of young people. So thanks again very much for being with us.